Unbelievable. I am off to a crack and start. Unbelievable. I am off to a crack and start. Unbelievable. Oh my I'm off God. To Fuck oh my today. God. All right, guys. Hey, let's try that again. <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. <laughs> Oh, man, there was a lot of echo. All right, we got it now. Sorry, guys, just dealing with a last minute cancellation. Had to change programs. Wanted to do it this way so that you can see who's chatting in the Discord. Because when we do book club, those that have access to hashtag reading and have signed up to uh, the Patreon just for the lowest tier, you get access to all the Discord and you also are a part of book club. So when everyone in the book club is talking their little icon will pop up in the discord shall we try it can everyone say hello guten tag hello. hello there they hello. all are hello. oh wonderful book club hello. members um i didn't have enough time to put the logo of the book in the corner as i usually do but we are i probably would be able it's a freaking day everyone um but let me figure out one cheeky thing. I'm going to look up Crooked Kingdom. Does everyone want to quickly... Last time we didn't rate the book out of 10, we just said if we were enjoying it. Let's go from top to bottom. Rate this book out of... 10... 5? 5? 5. Starting with Avery. What did you think overall of this book? Uh, I gave this one a 5. Uh, I just thought that... Like, the way it connected to the other one was just so beautiful. Like, the two stories just work together so nicely. And it just, I don't know, it was just done so well and uh, made me cry. So that's fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I hear you. we got a lot to talk about and unpack with this book. Uh, that was Avery. That was five out of five. Who's next? Clever girl, I have to unmute you. One second. There you go. One second. There you go. I'm unmuted. Sorry. I've been a little distracted. Um, like I that. love this book. I give it a five out of five. We got so much of um, what the characters are really like, the, their background, um, their inner feelings, and what shaped them. So I love this book. Another five out of five. This is a perfect Another score. Five out of five. Uh, yay, I've got the book. Oh, wrong way. Let's pop it in here. Let's go top left for it. Uh, who we got next? Game Wizard, Aaron, out of five. What are we getting? I'm giving it a four only because I didn't like how Matthias's ending happened. Oh, I can't wait to talk about this. Okay, so you knocked off a whole point, like literally 15, 20% of the score, 20% of the score potentially because of it. Yeah, I, I felt like, Okay, you shoot him. He then gets enough time to walk to say goodbye to his girlfriend and then dies in her arms. It's like, come on. Yeah, we're definitely 100% going to be talking about that. But it's so interesting oh, yeah. that it actually like affected the overall score of the book for you. It did. <laughs> all right. Like you, get, you go through all of this only to have this be your conclusion. This is your reward at the end of all your trials. I do have a... a um, um hold on sorry i am texting love hearts <laughs> um i texted the wrong emoji when it i wasn't supposed to and it's made everything worse <laughs> oh, oh god oh fuck maud you're a terrible friend da -da. um okay sorry with distractions all around cat it's over to you out of five <laughs> I tried to do two hearts, be like, yeah, everything's cool, ding, ding. And then one of them was like, eh. <laughs> no, uh, cat out of five. I'm drinking. I, I'm drinking. I'm pretty easy to please anyway, but this is still a five for me. Um, I love these books so much. Everything from Six of Crows on is a five for me. Um, great. And another five, Lisa. I completely agree with Kat. Um, this duology is probably my favorite duology. And I just love the characters. And if I cry every time I read it, <laughs> then you know I, I still love it. Um, and I agree, every book after Six of Crows is definitely five stars. 
Ah, oh, yes. Awesome. Cool. Because we're, cover we're covering them all. Uh, we just put a poll up on Twitter right now. I'm a bit loud. Sorry. Um, what do you rate Crooked Kingdom out of five? And so far, five out of five is getting the highest. Someone voted three out of five. Show yourself in the comments. Who's, do who's given it a cheeky three? Mm. Miss Nekarantz is saying five out of five. Ivari is saying five out of five. Uh, Kate, do we have you? Do we have you in the chat? I'm here. Hey, you gave it a perfect score as well. Tell me your thoughts on it. Well, it's just, it was like some, someone said earlier, it's a perfect companion to the first book where it does the heist thing, but in a different way, having shorter ones instead of a big long one. So it's not just a repeat. And I will say that Matthias's ending was perfect for him. And I can't wait to talk about it. Okay. All right. I've got, a th I've got a theory as well, but I'm loving that one. Hey, big thank you to Cheza B. Ah, 60. I think I know who Cheza is. Um, you're in the Discord as well, but now you're a follower on Twitch. A big hello. Did you read it, Cheryl? Did you read the book? Very excited to hear thoughts. Seb, you're not there. Jimmy, you said three out of five after a reread. That was your three. <gasps> yes, Do that tell. was me. Well, after our previous conversation of the first book, right, I was uh, I was contemplating about what we were talking about. And then I thought to myself, well, this makes uh, the main character, Kaz, in a different light to me. Okay. You know, like I used to think Kaz was pretty cool. But then I was like, you know what? Maybe he is a scumbag. So I, I was like, I'll reread this over and see how it was. And then I was like, yeah, this guy's human trash. He has very little redeeming qualities. <laughs> and, 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 but, you know, I still like Jasper or J uh, Jesper, Jasper, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call him. Yep. I think he is, he is one of the best characters ever. Okay. But yeah, I just, that's just my opinion. Um, it's really funny that you say that because I've got the notes open. Um, I need to tweak a few things because I need nine more screens. But uh, I have a Google Doc that I've shared with everyone that we all contribute to. And I have highlighted questions in red. And one of them is kind of like, Kaz, like, is this guy re redeemable? Is this guy exactly what you're saying? Is he a piece of shit? Have we got enough of a sense? Like he's, he's doing to others what he despised someone doing to him. Like, is that okay? Uh, but what we're going to do this time around, we're going to go chapter by chapter by chapter because that's how I've decided to tackle my re-listen to this time. Except uh, I think I ran out of time and I got, I think like the last three I didn't get, but we can summarize that easily enough. Um, but this is kind of like, you know, the same sort of structure where we're seeing a plan that we know very little about. We know some key pieces of that plan unravel. Um Hold on. If he's human trash, why did he set in motion to have Inez's parents found and brought to Ketterdam? I, I, yeah, but uh, you got to weigh up pros and cons. Like, and he, and he freed her contract. But like, he's pouring everything into one person. What has he ever done for Nina? I mean, he allowed her to save the Grisha. What has he ever done for Matthias? Like, he's made Jesper feel like an absolute piece of shit. Um, Kaz is only looking out for one other person, like himself and Inej, and that's kind of it. Uh, I, okay, all right, let's start with Kaz's redeemability because that's where the chat's going. Uh, Avery, let's talk about your comment saying, reading and talking about these two books together actually make me go back and change my rating uh, of the first book to five. You said four before. Why is that? Uh, it was just um, part of what I had said earlier, like about the way that the two books work together. And I mean, I agree with like that Kaz is like a terrible person and everything, but I, I don't know in the context of the book, like it doesn't bother me. Like, I feel like it says a lot about him and everything he's been through. And it says a lot about Ketterdam and um, just seeing kind of the way that the story progressed made me, uh, better appreciate like the setup of it in the first book which is why I went back and changed it because I think as a whole the story like the story together as a duology is just five stars overall and I yeah I think that the way that Ketterdam works and the way that the characters act and how they're all kind of problematic in their own ways but um, I think that that's it's a good thing for the story and I really enjoy that because I don't 
having like all these perfect characters all the time is boring. It, like it gets boring, you know. I like seeing some characters that have problems sometimes because it makes the story interesting. I think there's something to be said for these characters, Zoya and Kaz. They're almost like the male and female versions of each other where it's like they're so unapologetically themselves that it's up to you whether you decide to accept it or not. If you don't like it, you can bugger off. They're not going to change. They are fundamentally like that is who they are as a person and they've accepted that about themselves and they don't see it as wrong. They just see it as who they are and you either learn to love it or you break through the exterior. Uh, and Kat's d doubling down on the whole, an unlikable or bad person character is not the same as a bad character, you know? And I struggle with this. We've noticed like with Zoya, I'm just like, oh, head to desk. I can't stand this absolute brat. Um, and Kaz, it's a little bit the same for me. It's like, yeah, the Nesta syndrome. But I'm like... You just, you can't be 98% shit and then everyone go, oh my God, we got 2%. You're the best. It's like, Shezza, you say you're a lot like Zoya. Is that because you're really, really ridiculously good looking? Is that, is that, is that what maybe that could be? Or is it just unapolo unapologetically being yourself? Uh, Clever girl, you feel sorry for Kaz. Why is that? Because he's consumed by revenge. Um, I, I think he just didn't have, uh, didn't see that he had a lot of options. Um, he's so been shaped by anger and um, uh, really his own victimization. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of feel that under different circumstances, he could have been a much different person. And... Um, just knowing what he went through, I find it very hard to judge him. I get it. I mean, he, he this is nature versus nurture. Uh, very, very little, if any, nurture at all. Um, and so he acclimatized to his nature, which is Ketadam, which is brutal, ruthless, vindictive, um, untrustworthy, you know, whatever it takes to survive, which means you have to strip yourself of vulnerabilities and love and care and compassion. And, you know, you have to be the ugliest version of yourself in a way to exist. Um, and that's what we see Kaz as. Uh, all right, let's look, go through some of these chapter breakdowns and we can hit onto points as we go along. Um, Nikolai is what Kaz could have been under different circumstances. Avery, let's chat about that. Uh, yeah, so, like, Nikolai, we've seen, um, he's, like, when we read Shadow and Bone, uh, he's very, like, good at coming up with plans. He can get himself out of anything. He can talk his way out of situations. He's very smart, very flashy, you know, and, um, but he was raised as a prince, you know? He's, he's a king now. He has money. He's very, like, you know very privileged they had a more or less a good life whereas kaz he has those same like skills he can also get himself out of almost any situation he can come up with plans and work his way through things but he um grew up on the streets alone and had to fight to stay alive and as a result that has kind of corrupted him um and has basically kept him from like his full potential that i think Nikolai exhibits. Nikolai's lightness is Kaz's darkness. And it's so interesting. Something just popped into my head that I'm excited about. Inej talking about the worse you are and the more you carry and the more shadow you create, like you basically create the shadow version of yourself. Kaz is the shadow version of Nikolai. Nikolai is the light to Kaz's darkness. And I think that's super fascinating. But having that scene together... And having Nikolai be able to outsmart everyone except Kaz and Kaz just like seeing straight through it. Um, but like the respect that they have for each other and like just stripping the BS. It's so, so fascinating to see those two together. But there is a lot of likeness between the two. But this is again, sort of like nature versus nurture. In a way, Nikolai had nurture, even though we know his family history and what's going on there. But he had independence. He had money. He had, you know, um, 
a lot of privilege. He had a lot of power. Um, and Kaz is just had nothing and had to rebuild his version of an empire. So they're actually doing exactly that same thing. They've got, they've been stripped of power or they've, you know, whatever they've had has been burnt to the ground and it's up to them to rebuild. And to, to do that requires a little bit of trust, which they kind of found in each other. The two most unlikely people to kind of give trust in that particular way. Uh, all righty, chapter 18. We, this is, we're getting into part four here. Uh, from the book and this is a beautiful scene between Kaz and Wylan where Kaz is saying uh, talking about his knee and the fact that he's a cripple he's saying I made a choice I didn't let my vulnerability or you know the thing that's stopping me or holding me back I didn't let it define me and he's encouraging Wylan to do the same encouraging is an interesting word when we're talking about Kaz but it's this whole thing where it's like there's something that you don't like about you and you can either let it hold you back forever or you can own the thing. You, you can succumb to the shame that it brings and let that shame own you or you can find power in that thing. And the great analogy, which was, you know, what are people, what, what's my weakness? And, you know, made Wylan uncomfortable and Kaz just owns it. He goes, no, it's the fact that I need a walking stick. You know, I need a cane. Um, but what do people... With, if this is my weakness, what do people see when they're walking towards me? And Wylan's like, you get on the other side of the road because they're scared shitless of you. And he's like, exactly. It's shame that eats men whole. And I thought that that was a really interesting quote. Does anyone have anything that they want to kind of add to this particular quote about shame eating men whole? Um, I have uh, something to, to bring in there. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you who watch Dragon Ball Z. That's fine if you have it. But there's a scene in Dragon Ball where Goku is talking to Vegeta and Vegeta is wearing a pink shirt. And then Goku is like, hey, Vegeta, what's with the pink shirt? And he's like, what? I like pink. Bulma bought it for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. The point being, the point being is that Vegeta is like this tough guy, but because Bulma has changed him into a better person, He's evolving, so maybe if Inej can could uh, influence him enough, Kaz will be the better person and then be on his road to the redemption. That's my mm. opinion. Mm. I actually have a quote about that right at the end of the document. Uh, excuse me, I'm drinking a hard kombucha. Uh, Inej is keeping Kaz from going full dark side. And all he says is, there she goes again, seeking decency where there was none. And I'm like, mm, is she fighting a losing battle? Uh, Miss Necromancer, you said in the comments that um, talking about owning who you are completely was very uh, similar to the Game of Thrones scene between Tyrion and Jon Snow. Sorry, Jon Snow. Do you want to jump on and chat about that, Kate? Well, yeah, the whole thing with... Um... No one will ever let you forget that you're a bastard, so wear it like armor. Mm. And it's just that, you know, you know, like, you can't ever forget those things. Of, like, you can't ever forget that he's a, you know, he has to be blocked with a cane. And Wyland may never learn how to read, but it's just, you have to learn how to not let people hurt you with that by accepting that it's you and owning it and using it as your armor. Yeah. I also liked your previous comment saying even though Nikolai got turned into an actual demon, Kaz is the one who's given the demon Monica. Yeah, like Nikolai, it's the same sort of thing. Like Nikolai isn't demonic in his nature, you know, quote unquote demonic. And he was turned into a demon through the Darkling, but Kaz is. He embraces that. He was like, I'm like, I'll just be the monster you've made me. Like, I'll live in it. I love it. I am the monster. Yeah. So it's all just, again, they're the opposites of each other. One one has earned it and the other one, you know, it was forced upon him. Love it. Love that analogy. Uh, chapter 19, we've got Matthias in a way own, uh, leading his own Grisha army with uh, Jesper and Kuwait. And they have this little moment there as well. And you keep seeing Matthias check himself, his default, which is what he's been taught, which is like, oh, this power is unnatural, and then stopping it and being like, no, 
let's switch that perspective. This is miraculous. Was it kind of cool to see how he's really unlearning what he's been taught and kind of like completely changing his mindset and being able to provide a lot of sort of like thought provoking understanding, seeing both sides, all that kind of stuff. Does anyone have anything that they would like to add about uh, this scene? And realizing that the the Ruskela are just jealous of power because they weren't gifted with it. Does anyone like Matthias? <laughs> I don't. I have nothing against him. Just take it or leave it. Okay. I Kat? don't dislike him. Um, I I like how he has um grown or uh how he did grow a bit through it. Um, but I like him more, or I guess less as his own character and more just um, what he is to Nina. He's the accessory, the love interest, but with depth, like there's kind of. enough of a story to kind of understand it. Um, yeah, look, there is a trope. Um, my thoughts about... Yeah, look, there is a trope. My thoughts about Matthias are tied in with his demise so i don't know if we want to talk about all of that yet or we'll hold off just for a second clever girl you had something though clever girl you had something though uh, yeah i think um uh matthias is another person who's uh more or less the victim of his upbringing um i think given more time we could have seen him change more um but he had some uh, well, he had the guilt of betraying the person that he'd seen as a father figure. Um, he had all of the um, propaganda that he'd grown up with about the Grisha. Um, he did hard he time as well. He did hard time as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. I think we kind of yeah, forgot about Hellgate. Mm. forgot about Hellgate. Uh, right. And, and that had a tendency, I think, to really harden him. So um, I, I think it's hard for him to open up and trust and go against everything that he's been taught, everything that he's experienced. Um, I think at some point he said that his own family was killed by Grisha during a war. Yep, by the Inferni. Mm-hmm. And that was actually brought up during this part with Kuwait, actually- where Kuwait is like creating fire and flame. And straight away, like he has this initial reaction being like, oh, my God, I completely forgot. Like, this is what killed my family. It's the Inferni specifically that's happening here. Oh, since we like to compare things to pop culture, Matthias is Edward Norton's character in American History X. I never saw it. I Apparently, that's the kind of movie that you only need to see once. And I still didn't even get I didn't get there. I was going to say, I'm not American, but Kate, you're Canadian and you've seen it. So I just don't have an excuse. I just don't. (laughs) One day. One day if I want to feel a little bit sad, I'll watch it. Um, Fortunately, Nazis don't have country borders. uh, No, it's just because it says American History X. It's about Nazis. It's about Nazis. Is Jennifer Connelly in that one? Is Jennifer Connelly in that one? No. I got no idea. Are you thinking about Requiem for a Dream? That's a totally different movie. (laughs) They're the same movie in my head. They're exactly the same. I haven't seen either of them. (laughs) They're interchangeable. (laughs) Oh, no. Uh, Sorry. American History X, Edward Norton's character is a neo-Nazi and he goes to prison and learns and unlearns his bigotry in prison. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Passed his bigotry down to his younger brother, Edward Furlong. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And and Requiem for a Dream is? Drugs. Ah, yep. Good. Very different. Am I drinking fast? No. Okay. Clever Girl, did you have something that you wanted to add to that? Add to that. Well, I just uh, also appreciate Matthias as a straight man for Nina. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the banter is, I get the feeling that Lee Bardugo began to enjoy her characters more as she went along and, um, and actually made them more fun in some ways. That is one of my favorite things when you really, really get to know the character's strengths and weaknesses. And it, yeah, I know I was exactly the same cat, the straight man. And I was like, <laughs> uh, but yes, the fact that he's very stern and very abrupt and very sort of um, literal uh, and Nina's very fun and, you know, effervescent, effervescent, effervescent. You know, she's like a bird. Um, <laughs> but I love I absolutely agree with you. I love the interactions between those. And I remember that like Nina challenged something in like quite a literal way. And someone was like, wow, you're starting to sound like Matthias. And she's like, oh, I'm going to have to eat double the amount of food just to get through it. Effervescent. <laughs> Effervescent. It's just not a word I say often. Uh, I can see it. Matthias is absolutely the straight man of the ensemble and each ensemble cast needs a good straight man, says Miss Necromancer. Ah, oh, fun. Um, alrighty, so m let's move on. Uh, we're kind of entering these... It's a bit of a trope. I've used it for Fungeons Season 2, technically. It was Sorcerer Fed, where each of your characters has, like, the individual nemesis or like person to target them to, to sort them out. We, oh, I'm skipping over chapter 21. Sorry. This is the fact that Pekka has teamed up with Van Eck and uh, catches Kaz and Wylan in the house, even though it wasn't Wylan, it's Kawai, looks like Kawai. Um, but Kaz admitting that Pekka is his blind spot. Uh, Van Eck and Pekka, there is some great foreshadowing here where they have legacy in common. So this is when like they plant the seed for <laughs> pun intended uh, about their legacy. And Kaz saying a while and there is no safe. You'll never be safe. You'll there's no place to go that will remain safe. Like you're always going to be either running or in trouble or unsafe. And that's a weird thing for Wyland to have to accept. And then we move on to the fact that Nina can raise the freaking dead. Um, so, oh, wait, I missed chapter 21. Inej, simultaneously, we've got a bunch of shit going on. Inej has met her nemesis. So enter Denyasha. I, for one, thought this was a really forced and unorganic, inorganic um, entry of a character. We're bringing in sort of like a villain three quarters of the way through the duology that's specifically for Inej and the purpose of this character is just to kill Inej not for money but because Inej deserves to die and she's basically the better more trained assassin -y version of Inej and there's banter and interactions and this Danyasha nearly kills her and says you know I'm just going to hunt you down until you die so there's that constant sense of threat since we're d doing pop culture ball um I was going to say bullshit, but it's not at all. I love it. Since we're doing pop culture uh, analogies, this is your Darth Maul, episode one. Enter Darth Maul. He's going to chase you till you die, and it's going to feel a bit of threat. you got to take care of it. Kate, this character totally reminds me of a 2000s edgelord anti-hero character that would have been in a comic book, and proto-internet dudes would have thought it was the coolest shit. Yep. So yeah, it's Darth Maul. <laughs> yeah. Um, a villain that only has two scenes. She's cool, but it could have been used uh, used more moments to build her up better. Uh, oh no, ah, I have to go. Just know that I cried a lot and laughed when someone pointed out that there was in fact one funeral and five mourners. <laughs> great to have you cat sorry that we couldn't <laughs> have you for too long um that's a great comment though uh avery i can agree with that i expected danyasha to play a bigger role um i yeah i understand what she was trying to do with with this does anyone have any thoughts about danyasha well like i said in the chat i feel like a character with shifty eyes would have done just as well Mm. It's just like, here I am. Yeah. Ooh, I'm spooky, you know? 
Yeah, and I'm going to be a character that delivers exposition because I know who you are and I know what you've done and I wouldn't have made those choices. So I'm going to make you feel really bad about you. And then I'm also going to tell you that your fighting's predictable because you never got official training and you got taught by the streets of Ketterdam. So I know everything that you're going to do. But I'm also hired by Pekka Rollins, but not as a bounty on your head. I'm just going to do that from the graciousness of my heart. The whole fact that she also is like believes she's the descendant of the Lansdorff's or something. Eh. We'd never heard of this elite group of assassins before. Yeah, thank you, clever girl. She was just a device to complicate the heist. It was not, I didn't love it. But then you've got enter Eamon. So, all right, we've given him a name. He's obviously someone. Yeah, I'm going to take you, Nina, and you're mine now. And I'm not threatened by you and your flirtatious ways don't work on me. So she raised the goddamn dead. This is the first time we've really kind of pieced together that after manipulating bone and um, dead man dust, sh she's actually able to go and raise the dead. For me, this seems super OP. Uh, I understand about the Grisha power where it's like, you know, she was a heart render and she was, you know, all about life and death and sort of like the giving and taking. But for Judah Perem to completely disable her use of heart rendering but made her manipulate the dead what does everyone think about this progression of her power because to me it's pretty extreme aaron so she basically went from i can kind of stop people's hearts go you know, normal she gets the boost from Parm, she can do like a ton of people at once and then you know do plastic surgery on you with her mind and now she loses that and now she's a necromancer so go figure <laughs> uh kate sort you said my understanding of this oh sorry go ahead. oh i was gonna say well it's a kate says it makes sense to me do you want to explain how it makes sense kate mm. just posted there that life and death cannot live without each other they're the same coin like you can't have life without death and you can't have death without life they go perfectly together so it kind of makes sense that it would just kind of flip it so i wonder if a lot of if anyone else had survived if you think about the other grisha who took jure de Parem, what would have happened to their powers so would like a squalor create deserts like that sort of thing so you know I, I feel like it just a lot of people don't think that life and death are the same thing but they are you need death to push life and you need life to rise out of death Ooh, avery that's a good addition as matthias points out it's called the order of the living and the dead hmm. i like that i actually have a quote from that because i when i it was from nina's uh chapter yes uh it says it's it had seemed like a sham, a punishment, but just as surely as life connected everything, so did death. It was that endless, fast-running river. She dipped her fingers into its current, held the eddy of its power in her hand. She was the queen of mourning, and in its depth, she would never drown. End of the chapter. Yeah, that was full on. For me, I think the only inconsistency is that before, you know, as a heart render, she could slow hearts, she could speed up hearts, she could calm someone, she could aggravate someone. Um, she was able to do a slight bit of, you know, what other Grisha was able, Grisha were able to do, but to raise the dead like that, that seems like she was on Perem. Um, cause like before she was able to like wiggle and summon some bones and a little bit of dust. And now it's like actual animated corpses. So I'm wondering if you are able to push through to Perem, do you have Perem level power, but in the inverse? Cause that's, I think that was like the confusing part for me. It was like, Ooh, I can do a little bit of this. Ooh, I can do a little bit of that. I'm raising an army. I was like, that was, this escalated. Um, I, I don't know <laughs> since I've read so far ahead, I, I'm hoping that there's no kind of spoilers here, but I think there's been references to, um, how all things are connected and uh, the power at the making um, of the world. And so I, I think this is just um, another manifestation 
uh, the powers that it would have been possible for Grisha to have, you know, if they had sort of pursued this or um, uh, maybe gone in a different direction. So I, I think we're just barely tapping into what a Grisha could possibly do. Damn. If that's the case, something that I made note of when I was reading this was, I mean, we're inundated with superpowers. You know, how many stories, how many superheroes are there? Marvel, DC, you name it. But this is sort of like, it's, if you have a superpower, like, and a great example is Invincible. If you've got the superpower, you hold all the cards, you have all the power. And what I've noticed about the Grishaverse is that if you have the superpowers, you are more often than not hunted, killed, not working, chastised, are a low level indentured um, working class member of society. We are in an army where you're serving in the war. Like there's not too many glorified, like why aren't all leaders in the positions of power Grisha? How did they not sort of usurp um, all the other members of society? Because they have, uh, bigotry is the stronger power. Thank you, Kate. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Do you want to do you want to talk about do you want to talk about that? Well, I mean, you see it like obviously we don't have people in power with superpowers around here, but you would figure it's like why aren't the smartest people in the world always the ones in charge? It's because the mob, the unwashed masses, dumb dumb mob, have more power because of just sheer numbers and sheer fear. It's easy to manipulate fear into subjugating. Yeah, it's like, you know, like with like other or immigrant or, you know, anything like that, like Grisha are still a minority. So even though they have superpowers, it's easy to push fear the same way that religious organizations in the past pushed fear of other into you know people following them because mm. people are afraid and they'll just you know believe whatever someone who's charismatic will tell them right so obviously not all grisha are going to be like the darkling and try and you know control everyone they don't want to use their powers like that so they aren't willing to you know make everyone their slave just so they can rise above mm. i love that you're right i get it it did like it did cause thought for me though, where I was just like, "Huh." Usually we see the opposite of this, you know. We see, but it's the same. Like if you ha if you are showcasing more power, then you must be brought down. And yeah, sprinkles, you make a really great point in the comments there. To quote Proximo, "Oh my gosh, Zelda, you're so loud with your snoring, my love." Oh, I love this dog. She just grunts like a piglet. Um, control the mob, win your freedom. Yeah, and if the majority don't have it and the minority do have it, it must be taken or it must be controlled. I get that completely. It reminds me of the wizard's first rule. There are stupid, uh, that people are stupid and because of that, they will believe any lie you tell them uh, because they believe it to be true or is, uh, because they believe it to be true or is afraid it might be true. There we go. What's the first wizard's rule? The wizard's first rule in what? What's that from? Aaron? Uh, it's from, it's the first book in a series by Terry Goodkind. Uh, it's the the book series that the Legend of, of the Seeker TV series was based oh, off yeah, of. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey. They believe it to be true or they're afraid that it might be true. So they'll believe anything. Huh, I like it. Uh, all right, so Nina's got these powers, and it's like, yep, cool. Uh, Avery said, I, in I interpreted it as Perem completely rewriting whatever causes Grisha powers, almost like she permanently has Perem in her system. It's so interesting, though, like, because there was that addiction piece where it was like, I need it, I need it, I need it. And then when she kind of was, like, able to harness that other power, it suppressed the need as if it, like, had evolved or she'd pushed through, maybe? Hmm. Uh, at this stage, we realize that the Lion's Dime have been promoted to help the Starred Watch uh, and some of the members of the Crows and the Dregs have joined in as well, mainly the Crows. 
Kawhi suggests that he's going to give himself up. And Wylan's like, oh my God, this was all for nothing. And he has a bit of a freak out. Kaz and Jesper fight. Things escalate to the point where shit actually goes down. I thought it was really quite interesting, though, when those two come to blows, that Nina, Inej, were they just like standing back? They're not blushing, you know, they're not bashing an eyelid. They're just, it is what it is. But then Kaz calls Jesper Geordie. We finally see the crack in his armor. And it takes sort of like dad, da, to pull him into line and for them to stop. Um, and then I think a really great diffusing technique that happened here was these things came to a head and they blew up. Who's Geordie? What the hell? They're bleeding. Uh, Comb comes in and he's like, get downstairs, the count of 10. Oh, do I remember hearing that as a kid? Um, and then Kaz goes into his strategic thinking and they're like oh my god it's the thinking face it's the you know he's doing the thing and he's like yeah i figured it out i've got it so i don't know dudes and testosterone is so funny because you'll get to a point where you're like all right now i have to hit you Ugh, okay we're good Whew. we came to that point we just had to hurt each other and then i got it out and now we're okay again um dudes in the chat is that really how it goes? And can you explain that? Because us women, we will not say anything and hold a grudge for seven years until we finally say something, but the damage is done so permanently and it snowballed to a place where it's only pure hatred. So can you tell me about the ooh, ooh, bang, bang? <laughs> well, the best thing I could tell you, I'm not like the most macho guy because I, I know I have low testosterone. So I've always had low testosterone. So I'm, I'm always like a guy that is like, tries to talk, talk it out mostly. But there are times when I do get angry, but you know, like for the most part, I try to uh, navigate correctly. But again, could be low testosterone thing. Aaron, you ever punch someone? When I was a little kid. <laughs> okay. But most, most of I've, I've gotten to the point as an adult where it's like, yes, I could punch this person, but there are consequences. And are these consequences worth punching this person in the face. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I usually think about it before I choose. <laughs> Sometimes I'd like that I... with women. It's just like, instead of just holding it in or not saying anything or being emotionally manipulative, we can just be like, bang, all right, we're done. <laughs> Maybe I have a I little recall... testosterone. I recall as a child being so angry at my brother that I threw an umbrella at his head and I gave him a permanent scar. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My brother threw my other, um, a fire truck at my brother, sliced his lip open. That same brother sprayed uh, bug spray in my eyes and nearly blinded me forever. Yeah, yeah, it's what you do. Yeah, um, my sister once threw me through a table too. So that's, that's another thing. <laughs> I fell through a table. It happens. It's a thing. Kate said, there is no room in Kaz's heart for anyone other than Geordie, even if that Geordie is just a warped memory of his brother that wasn't even true. Clever girl, I think seeing Geordie in Jesper shows that Kaz really does care for him. Yes, he sees him as his pseudo brother in that way, but also has this same resentment. I think he's projecting onto Jesper a disappointment or a resentment or how dare you or you were never there or it's just like... And I think that's why Jesper's kind of like, all right, who's Geordie? What's going on here? Because there's, there's some ca carryover. Wait, that's the thing about Kaz. Whatever has affected him, it doesn't leave. He doesn't move past it. It continues to control, own, destroy him from within. And that's because he is so fixated and revenge doesn't really allow room for healing. Uh, clever girl, I have five sons. They're always fighting. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You're exactly right, Lauren. We all forget that they're kind of kids. They're supposed to be 17. Yeah, I forget. Um, all right, moving on. The plan has been formed. So in part two, how are we going for time? Pretty good. In part two, Jesper apologizes to Inej about his role in the last book. Uh, we learn about Suli customs, which I really like. They don't apologize just for existing. There's just no, like they realize that there's no slight. Uh, I think that that would be super, super wonderful where it's like, all right, I'm going to get deep. 
I feel like in the past few decades, we've gone from benefit of the doubt, like as a default. So if someone bumps into you accidentally, or if someone sort of like rubs you the wrong way, or if someone's trying their best and they've affected you negatively with decision-making, whatever it is, our default has gone from benefit of the doubt. I understand that your intention wasn't to hurt and no one's intention is to really hurt. Like majority of the time we're doing our best and we're not wanting to hurt. And yet we perceive or receive it as our default, which is now, how dare you? So we've gone from benefit of the doubt. I can't say benefit of the doubt really quickly. Benefit of the doubt. Yes, I can. To how dare you? And what I love about this Suli tradition is that it's like we don't have a word for sorry for those instances because we realize that you didn't mean to do anything wrong. We just ask that you don't continue that behavior, that you make a conscious effort to not repeat the thing. And that's essentially being like, you know, an apology only means something if you do make the effort to not do it again. Otherwise, if you start, keep apologizing for the same thing, that's emotional manipulation. And I really like that Suli custom. Um, and I, again, it just like is such a testament to Inez where she's like, I don't want your apology. I just want you to show that you're not going to do it again. And he is actually really great about that where he's like, I don't know if I can promise you that right now because it's an addiction. But he's like, I will try to be better. And I guess that's not the best that you can do. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts about um, our default now being how dare you uh, and this Suli custom? Do you like it? Do you understand it? Is there a pop culture analogy that we can place upon it? I think we wouldn't have freeway shootings if um, people had uh, didn't have that default um, reaction that we've developed. Yep. Now that I've said that, like look at every little instance, like where people will make a choice to respond with a how dare you mindset. Any little thing, it's like, how, how dare you? How dare you do that to me? And like, they'll look at you awfully or it's like, there's no compassion or space to be like, oh, I don't know if, you know, I, I know your intentions couldn't have been like that. It was like, oh, you have wronged me. I have been wronged. Anyway. Anyway, uh, moving on, uh, we talk about um, Jesper's relationship with his father and Com's restrictions um, were set in place to be like denying his Grisha powers. He put them in place to protect Jesper and it's ended up hurting him in a very, very different way. Um, there was confirmation that addiction was from not using his powers. I was right, yay, I called it. That the, the addiction was like the way that he, that was his sickness. <laughs> Hey, I'm Sayel. How are you? Thanks for the follow. And then Jesper is like all flustered and he goes in and sees Wylan just hitting one note on the piano and he goes and kisses him. Kuwait is a little shit. Uh, Kate, you love this moment with uh, Kuwait. Do you want to jump on and chat about <laughs> this cheeky moment? Well, I loved it so much because Kuwait doesn't have a lot to do. No. He's just kind of, you know, a prop same way Wyland kind of was at the in the first part of the series where Kuei is like that now where he doesn't get any screen time like he doesn't get his own chapters but he also doesn't get much to do in other people's chapters either mm. so it's kind of was like oh wow like we're seeing like flashes of his personality where you figure he would be I don't know like sad and like morose and like moody because like he has every reason to like he's in a terrible situation he lost his father he's just like punted and all this stuff but it's just there's this glimmer of just him being like shithead and i loved it that he was just like <laughs> as a spark of kind of like mischief miss you know mischievous joy there yeah he was kind of rising above this shitty situation to be just like flirty and he's like well i mean i'm just gonna take advantage of the situation and get this cute guy to make out with me and even in the end where he's like you could come to ravka with me 
He's developed such a crush on Jesper. And, you know, if you take a step back, Jesper's always the one who's kind of looking out for him in a way or he's like, you know, don't go so hard on him. So he's stepping in to protect Kuei. You're exactly right. Kuei just has no purpose. He's a hostage. He's never given a say. He's kind of pretended that he doesn't understand what's going on most of the time. Uh, but for him to kind of like really F with that moment, when I listened back to it the second time, like he's not speaking He's realizing that this is his only opportunity that he's going to get. So he takes full advantage of it. Like, <laughs> and then when Jess was like, you're more trouble than you're worth. He's like, hey. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, he also, it shows that he is observant too, because he could plainly see that Jesper liked Wyland. Mm -hmm. Like he, and he was hiding that he was like fluent in Kirch. And Wyland was like, He's not even doing any science. He's just drawing, like, naked pictures of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's just fixated. But I think that that was a really fun... Like, that was, like, a laugh-out-loud moment because, like, my stomach dropped when you realize that it was Wylan who got it, you know, who walked in on it and he's already walked off and Jesper's trying to fix the whole thing and Koi's just got the most smug look on his face being like, no harm, no foul. <laughs> like, you kissed me, buddy. What I thought was really brilliant, and this is a female gaze for sure, and that was that Jesper kissed him and it felt wrong. Like his mind was wandering and he's like, I've wanted this kiss for so long and that if my, my mind is wandering, something's up. And it was really interesting to hear the inner dialogue of Jesper, which is, what do you say when it's not a good kiss? And I thought that that was really interesting where there's like a lot more than just like a physical kind of sharing of mouth saliva, but it's like this deep connection and that felt wrong, even though he was sure it was Wylan. And then to have, you know, the, what, the way they talk about their kiss when they actually do, it's like night and day. It meant so much more and it felt right. I don't know. I thought that was really interesting, but I loved that dynamic for Kuei and it's actually one of my favorite, um, moments that we get from him because you're right the first half of the book's a little uncomfortable almost they shut him down they treat him less than he's in the way and then Kuei kind of has his little moment but even then like he gets shut upon I mean he was shifty absolutely shifty but he's just not getting this guy's so he's harnessing like almost what could be the antidote of the end of the world and he's always constantly just cast away push to the side interesting dynamic uh let's move through the next part uh kaz and anesha's intimate moment holy hell i could see this so hard how it's going to be in the tv series with flashbacks and the moments and the close-ups and like you know with the hand on the skin and brushing this whole thing is just so visual for me but basically the inner dialogue from Kaz, this is from Kaz's perspective, um, the pull between seeing the signs that she is in fact alive, she can see very much her heartbeat. It says one of two things, the fact that this is not a dead corpse that he's dealing with and so his PTSD should try to pipe down, but also that she is also in a very heightened state. She's like going through shit of her own, but it's also like that intensity of the moment. Um, he, he wants to lean into his want but this memory and the panic of PTSD is drowning him. I, he obviously, when it gets to a point, he just shuts down and he puts his walls up and he pushes her away to protect her. I just want to scream, oh my God, here we go again. Get too close, push away. Um, but I really liked how Inej handles this. She has so much patience with him. And I think it's because she can relate to what he's going through. Like, you know, they're all, they're both kind of dealing with, a really ugly past that they've had to survive through. But Inej is also being vulnerable because she doesn't like being touched either. Um, but she's almost willing and patient to sit through Kaz's nihilism. And uh, Inej continues to be his hope. And then Kaz gives Inej the clue of looking for Danyasha's tell. But what did you think about this sign where he's trying to um, replace her bandages in a very intimate moment? School Cleaver, they have a very special intimacy from both of them. Yeah. Um, I feel th this scene was uh, very, um, uh, for lack of a better term, kind. Like he's mm. there's definitely trying to do something, but like Matthias and Nina, it's it's just like 
that longing that's always going to be there. You know, it's like they can't break that can't break that glass ceiling or whatever you want to call it mm. to get through. You know, so it makes it like uh, that movie with with Ryan Reynolds' friends where they hug, shake when they meet each other instead of kissing. It was very awkward. That's the point I'm saying. It was it was kind of like awkward. Mm. You know, best way I can say it. Uh, clever girl, you just said something wonderful in the comments. Do you want to read it that out and elaborate on it? Um, yeah, just uh, it said somewhere in there they were two worry creatures united by their distrust of the world. Um, she's been badly damaged too, and at one point. She wonders that um, if she could have, um, if he had reached out to her, if he'd kissed her um, or opened up to her, if she could have accepted that or if she would have recoiled. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really says something about Kaz trying so hard to actually touch her when uh, they're both so damaged. Um, you know, it, it's uh, not just a psychological thing, but they've actually experienced um, uh, physical abuse. Mm. Yeah, you're right. They, uh, I'm wary of the term damage because, I mean, they're fictional characters at the end of the day, but I've learned to kind of like, you know, justify it with they've been traumatized and this is trauma and it's. I think last week we chatted a lot about trauma bonding uh, and this is a great example of it where they're both gone through so much and their trauma is kind of like something that only each other could really understand. Nina wants to hug her. Jesper th like casually puts his arm around her and she is recoiling. The thing about Inej and Kaz that they are really on the same page with is compartmentalizing. Inej learned to compartmentalize her body from experiencing what her body did. And at one stage she's like, yeah, I think that was one of her, my clients. Oh, um, and Kaz has just learned to compartmentalize emotion, caring, feelings, love, and then trying to compartmentalize touch and really failing. And we hear throughout the book time and time again, just how he's failed with this and how it consistently affects him uh, in a way that kind of like collapses him. Uh, but I think that that's what I really, really love about this is that the use of tension and intimacy is so delicate that it can just literally be like the touch of a finger over a knuckle is so extremely heightened. Whereas Nina's just like, Matthias, get on me. I want to smooch all around and I want all of your body touching all of my body at once. And he's just like, but I have traditions. So it's just interesting seeing different forms of intimacy um, between these people. Let them smoke. That's exactly right. That is our unofficial slogan. Uh, anyway, it was one of my favorite chapters. Um, Inej sees Kaz's plan to bring down Pear Haskell from inside. So Kaz has an amazing thing and we've seen this time and time again where he doesn't necessarily do the act but he has the information where he can catch someone in a position that will be their undoing and in this instance it is getting beaten up getting making sure that there's a crowd and then targeting Pear Haskell with the decisions that Pear has decided to make that goes against all of the dregs values and he's able to unravel him because he's just put him in that position and played the cards in a particular way but I thought that that scene was interesting. But you just see Kaz like exhausting his mind and body in the second half of this book, which is a little tricky. Chapter 27, uh, Nina says that Jenny is at the embassy. Wyland's like, yes, put me back to normal. I want to be me again. Enter Sturmhund. Oh, this is such a great part of the book. Um, what did anyone want to weigh in on the storm the Sturmhund chapter the scene the introduction the reliving of this character was it like getting a warm hug was it refreshing to have him back I freaking loved it I feel it that it was uh, uh, like you said uh, like a, uh, a burst of fresh air because he's got you know a sharp wit he's flirtatious you know he's, he's having a little fun you know it's, it's it works out nicely yeah 
It was nice. Any Stone Hunt fans, you loving the fact that he's in this book in this particular way? Does it make sense to you? I love Nikolai and uh, his German persona also. And I thought that it was uh, done really well by using the Sturman character to bring uh, into this book because Nikolai as Nikolai wouldn't really have made sense since he's like King of Ravka now. So having him, you know, pretend like he's not Nikolai and to deal with this whole situation, like it's very in character for Nikolai and also just works. I thought it worked really well with the book and... Yeah. Yes, agree, agree, agree. I loved it. I love that we were able to revisit this character. I thought that maybe Storm and Siege would be the last time we saw or heard of Stormhund. Storm, Stormhund. Storm dog. <laughs> um, but it was really cool that we got to see this character in this particular moment because it absolutely made sense. Um, I loved seeing Kaz and Zoya face off where he's just like just talking down to her and has full control. And she's like, ah, and he's like, I'm going to tell you what to do right now, but if it helps, I can make it sound like it's a question. So you had a say. And I was like, Mwah, chef's kiss is all you sit down. It was, it was perfect. Um, but I also love Kaz and Sturmhund because we, what we were talking about before, there's such a match of wits, but one of them had privilege and the other one had nothing. Yeah, the sass off. Absolutely. It was great. Uh, we get while and um, Jenya puts his face as close back to normal. We see that Jesper has um, taken a canvas from the first part of the book where they visited the asylum to help with his features. Uh, and then Wylan suggests that Jesper is a good shot due to his talents. I was right again. De -de 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 -de. That was fun. Um, Wylan missed Jesper. Why did I write that? Uh, but then the, oh, kissed. It's supposed to be kissed. Wylan kissed Jesper. And I like this moment as well. What did you think about this finally happening? Do we have Wesper or um, Jylan fans? Definitely team Wesper. Wesper. Because it worked, worked so well together. There was no anything. It was just like, oh, it's happening. Here we go. You know what I mean? It's like, I did it. I really like that Wyland stepped up quite literally and kissed Jesper. Like he was kind of like declaring himself, which was nice. Um, I wonder though, if he had to be in his original body to be able to finally like kiss him as him. Do you think that there was a component to that, that he had the confidence again? Well, it makes sense. Like in the terms of like, if body switching is catfishing, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. because you're not that person so you can step out of your boundaries and act a different way. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. That's yeah, he wanted to kiss Jesper as him and maybe him only and only as him. Yeah, I do think so. I think Jesper kiss Kuei, I think, doubled that. Yeah, he wanted to really differentiate that. He wanted to remove... He didn't want to have to take another chance. I think that would have, you know, hey, I didn't know it was you. You look the same. And that's like, right, no, nah, no longer. I want to go back to me. Yeah, I served my time doing this. I played my part. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm moving. I'm going to move through these next chapters a little bit quicker. How do we feel about Kaz bringing Jesper's dad into the equation for the for the, the heist, the rue, the plan? What do we feel about this? Do you are you okay with Calm being kind of forced into this? It's on brand for Kaz. <laughs> yeah. Anyone want to weigh in on this? Um, I, I think it's um, very typical of Kaz. He'll use anyone. But I also think that it's um, a parent's nature, especially someone like Colm, to be willing to do anything for his son to make sure that his son is okay and kind of by extension his uh, his son's friends the people that his son cares about yeah this is a man that will do anything for jesper and i think he's trying i don't know i think maybe he's realized that that making decisions for jesper based on being a grisha has impacted him in a in a negative way he's been a little bit too overprotective in that which is understandable because he lost his wife. Like, you know, it all makes sense. Um, 
But it's interesting because like, I wonder, like I put myself in that position where it's like, if I was sent to university, but instead of being at uni, my mom discovers that I'm like $200,000 in debt to like three of the nearby casinos because I just can't stop sitting down at the cards or spinning a wheel. And that that was money that my mom had put into my entire tertiary career. I mean, um, you know what I mean? Education. And I blew it all. And then found out that in my criminal activity to try and pay off bills, like I was the bad guy and I was messing around with the wrong people. And the person that I was kind of indebted to because of my gambling addiction brought my mum into something. She would disown me so fast. There is absolutely no way. This would she be like, this is your bed. Lie in it. Oh, okay, clever girl. I think you need to weigh in on this as a mum. I'd be interested to know. Um, my boys have done some things, including um, some illegal activities that um, I just as soon not know all the details of. Um, but I keep telling them I may not like what they do, but I will never stop loving them. And um, I'm I'm here to help them. Um, I don't want to enable them, but I will do anything I can to help them and just be there for them. I'm just texting my mom right now. Text my mom right now. Uh... Hey, mom, if I broke the law, stole hundreds and thousands of dollars off you because I had an addiction and then I needed you to get me out of a bad deal with criminals, would you step in and help me? We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> then you're very, very sweet, clever. Uh, I feel very strange calling you clever girl when you're telling me about your gorgeous sons, but there you go. Uh, uh, next, let's move forward to let's the... Move forward to... Um. Yes. My, my name's Colleen. That's, yes. Colleen? that's better. Colleen? Yeah. I can do Colleen. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Um, all right. So next we talk about uh, the plan starting to go into action, but Wyland gets kidnapped. Did anyone see this coming? Were you like, what? We've gone through all of this only for him to be kidnapped and the plan's going to be foiled? Or were you like, wait a second, who saw this coming? Who was surprised? I was definitely surprised. I didn't see it coming because, but you know, like after, like I said, the reread, I was like, okay, it makes sense. But in the initial one, definitely surprised. It threw me off. I was like, what? Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. I was like, really? What? We did so well. How did this happen out of all of this? Anyone else? Nox, I saw you unmute earlier before, by the way. Did you have something that you wanted to add? No, that's fine. Welcome. I think I didn't see this coming for what it's worth. Yeah, no. And I was just like, God damn, this poor kid. He's just like finally got his face back and he was immediately kidnapped. Maybe being Kuwait was not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, Colleen says, Bodugo just manages to keep me off balance all the time. Yeah, agree. Um, they are... The, the deal has started. We see that Kaz has predicted pretty much perfectly yet again how he thought the... Um, exchange was going to go, how the auction was going to go. Sturmhund was going to wait until 50 million, uh, 40 million, sorry, and then get straight in there, predicting that the shoe would go 50 million and like it would be ramped up. That's exactly what happens. While all this is going down, um, Inej sees uh, Kuwait getting uh, prodded, you know, for the auction. Uh, he gets tested to see if he's in good nick and she's getting sort of like bad flashbacks from that. Um, Matthias is being recognized by his former people and they are chanting a word that I only assumed was traitor in the Fjordan tongue. And then as the um, whole auction is taking place, tide makers intercept and declare the deception with the auction. Apparently false funds were created to swindle money to give to drum roll. Q Vanek being like, mm -mm, I knew it was Ravka. It's totally Ravka, the shoe. And he's like, what? And everyone's like, what? And Kaz is like, mm. <laughs> that's how this is going down. Um, and then uh, I mean, I'm just kind of paraphrasing cause I'm only going by my notes. Um, but 
Wayland's obviously there. He's completely beaten up and looks the part of someone that has been almost tortured, but very much beaten up. And um, Vanek in there going, no, 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 Wyland, isn't this the truth? You did it. And he's like, I'll just say whatever you want me to say so you don't hurt me again. Cue the distrust. Cue everyone going, uh, 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 Jon Van Eck's a bad dad. What the hell's going on? Planting lies and deceit. Planting character assassination. All the pieces are falling into pl uh, to place. And because previously Van Eck saw Kuwait, who was actually Wylan, they're putting those two together and they're like, wait a second, you knew Kuwait was here. That's information that you should have shared. And he's like, ah, ah, ah. And then he's accused of making the deal with the shoe, fleecing the merchant council out of like 70 million Kruger. Uh, and then the sirens start blaring. Cue the plague by Nina. And then you hear a bullet be shot. So this is all happening at once. And I can't wait to see this play out because you can see that again, like in the first book with um, Six of Crows, we had the time, the bells ringing to keep us on track of where this was in the timeline. In this particular instance, you have crucial moments like a siren blare and a gunshot. And then you see how all the, um, what action takes place leading up to those points and then the continuation from those points. Uh, do we want to talk about Nina unleashing a plague and another development in her new powers where she can basically spread death, harmless death? What did you think about this moment? Anyone? I feel like that moment was very pertinent because it basically is like the smoke screen for the thing to be pulled off because if she didn't do it, then there would be no distraction. You know what I mean? That's my opinion, though. I feel like this is like this is a new power, and immediately Kaz is like, "How can I use this to my advantage?" Exactly. Oh, Avery, yes, talking about how that this plays so cinematically. Yes, do you want to jump on and talk about that? Yeah, just um, I know we've talked about this with other scenes before, but just the detail that she uses and the way that she describes things. Like, I just can picture everything so perfectly when I'm reading scenes like this. And, like, it's happened in multiple books. Because uh, I know we talked about it with um, the scene in Rune and Rising where Nikolai's in the trees. And um, we talked about it uh, with... Six of Crows, and then this one, and I know, I've, I'm a little bit ahead. There's another scene in um, King of Scars. It's like that, too. And it's just, I don't know. I don't know how she does it, but just the way that she writes it just creates these, like, gorgeous, like, almost cinematic images in my mind that I almost feel like I'm watching it rather than reading it. And it's just a really cool effect. 100% agree with you the language that she uses you can almost see the angle that the events are taking place I, I, she talks about like body movement impact reaction response like yeah it's really really well done but it's not using excessive words either it's really like she's become quite a stellar writer which i'm really loving um so yeah, Nina is uh, going into all the places that Pekka Rollins zones for its long-term destruction. What I found really interesting is how Kaz would have swayed Nina to use this new ability purely, I mean, I'm wondering if he convinced her because it was just this moment that it was necessary, but Kaz is playing a much longer game and that is to brick by brick destroy Pekka Rollins' complete establishments uh, demonopolize him, you know, like take all of his assets and all of his establishments and render him, like burn it to the ground. Because I just feel like Nina was a little bit of a puppet in this moment. Am I wrong? Oh, she was, I, I would agree with you on that one. She's definitely a puppet because, uh, you know, like Kaz and Pekka are definitely at odds with each other and they're both you know, uh, have their hook in, in things that they own. So the best way to make a rich person angry is to take away their money. You know, you don't have money, then 
you're poor, now you're going to get really angry, you know. Well, not and even so taking like, away their money. I'm, I'm going to stop you and all your future earnings. I'm going exactly. to unravel everything you've built and I'm going to raise it all to the ground. So it's not merely about I just stole what's in your um, coffers, you know, and now you don't have that amount of money. That's it. Thank you, Clever, uh, Colleen. It is reputation. He's making sure that he can never start again he can never rebuild so he's like salting the earth in exactly a way exactly right really great way to say it yeah go, go. chapter 35 we're going back to the inej and dinyasha showdown this time she comes prepared jesper has managed to sew some mattress into her clothes so she doesn't get pish ninja start again uh she is looking for the tell that kaz told her to look out for which is a hitch of her breath um, a showdown happens, she gets blinded, but then Inej realizes that she doesn't need to see because she knows Keta Dam like the back of her hand. Learn fear now before you die. Obviously, this was just a way, again, uh, to thicken the plot and to distract Inej and take her out of the equation at the moment. But I've had in the Google Doc that we've all prepared here in red, does this character make sense and does it feel organic to the story? I know we kind of touched upon it as well, but with this closure, did this add anything in this moment? Did it feel good for Inej? Did you feel anything? Um, maybe only in that it gave her more power okay. um, and more control over her own life. Yeah, I'll agree with you on that. It's almost like she was living one way the entire time, but realized that she could be better um, and learn and continue to learn. You know, her ways that were set in stone were almost like blocking her in this particular instance. So she had to go above. Um, this is probably for me the weakest part of the book. I feel like it was shoehorned in and it was a means to the end storytelling wise. Knox, agree, disagree? Well, I think it was sort of like kryptonite to Inez. Inez's superhero in powers were it was almost like there wasn't any stopping in edge and she was sort of the top of her game and having something come and actually challenge her and make her face death on a more level, more ex existential level. I think it was, it was a surprise, but I, I liked the way it happened. For me, I thought that the character development with Inej in the first half of the book was a lot stronger than the second half. The first half, she was kidnapped and she had to entertain the possibility of what her life looked like with her legs shattered. And she had to come to terms with the fact that her use, this is what Kaz does. Kaz plants your value in you, which is a very narcissistic thing to do. He plants a value that he can take away from you. So one of the quotes that I've written down is with Jesper. What good is a gunslinger without his guns? What good is a shooter without his guns? Inej, my wraith, you, you, know, you serve a purpose and your worth to me is only if you can do that particular job. And for her to have that dispute of, I love this man, but if I can't walk, I don't think that he'll have me. And I think that that was far more powerful for Inej than having a doppelganger, you know, villain who's stronger. Like, uh, that was a bit naff for me. Uh, Avery, I thought the Suli idea of everyone either having a shadow or being a shadow was interesting, but I think it could have been done better. Yeah, that didn't feel like it for me. It felt like, like if I had heard about this Assassin League in the shadow and bone trilogy if they'd been mentioned before and it was like an enigma or if it was like yeah there's the grisha army but then there's this like underground kind of like you know or the opposite of the suli who are the traveling people you had the the hired league of people that don't follow any rules whatever it was but it would be cool for this to have a little bit more depth than shoehorned in <sighs> all right 
Uh, chapter 36, I have another question that I want to pose to everyone. Jesper was faking diarrhea. <laughs> Always funny. Always funny. Um, but then he had his own showdown with the souped up shoe that have a name that I tried to look up and I didn't care because there was no point. Was there enough of a payoff to introduce these new shoe villains at the start of the book that have wings and metal plating under their skin to just have it dealt with in this way? I want to open that to the whole chat. Was there enough payoff to introduce this new villain and then have it dealt with this way? What are your thoughts on it? Who wants to jump on in? Who wants to jump on in? Colleen. Um, I'm not sure about this book. It kind of heightens the um, the drama, I guess. But uh, just remember that this isn't the last book in the series. Okay. <laughs> Avery said the exact same thing. Uh, that hel That helps because I thought that it was an absolute waste. I thought it was so impressive in the first half of this book that it was hunting the uh, Grisha by smell, that they were tailored by uh, Judah Perem. Ju Ju yep, Jerda, Jerda, sorry, Jerda Perem. Um, that they were like super soldiers. And I thought that it was so interesting just to have it only fleetingly come in for convenience's sake again uh, in this particular moment. For those who has not read the next duology, I have one. Kate, you haven't either. So, Kate, I'd like to hear your thoughts on on the sh the super soldiers. <laughs> the super soldiers. That's so much better for this book. What did you think about the the scene with the uh, scene? You know what I mean. This chapter with uh, Jasper. I didn't really have an opinion on them. Like, I guess that shows how much of an impact they made, but now I can't unsee what was written in chat. So it's like, oh, okay, they have a purpose later on. Mm. Pretty good introduction, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jesper has realized that his aim and accuracy is because of his Grisha powers. He is using the force to manipulate the bullets to get his shot. The shot, of course, is QA. Oh, my God. They bloody shot him. What the hell? There's blood everywhere. Uh, there is a showdown between Kaz and Pekka Rollins where he's just like, hey, by the way, I took your son. He's buried alive. You, you should probably, you know, not kill me and beg and I'm going to destroy you brick by brick because I found out your one vulnerability that I get to use against you and you can't use against me because I'll never let the person I love close enough to me for her to be a target, even though she was at the beginning of this book. And uh, Kaz has swindled so many people. He runs a club where the house always wins. He makes targets on pigeons all the time. How is it different that Pekka Rollins has done exactly what Kaz does to him? Kaz has done a lot of bad shit. Why is it justified? Because he's doing it just to get back to, at the guy who did it to him. I think it's only justified. I think it's only Kaz's head. I don't think anyone else feels that justification. You know, like uh, when you when you wrong someone so much and you hold on to that hate and that anger, it fuels you much like Arya in Game of Thrones. She would go to sleep. She would list the names of all the people she was going to kill. You know, and, and, you know, and that's what got her through the rest of her life. Yeah. Because otherwise, yeah. she wouldn't have been able to make it through. It's a really good point. Really good analogy too. Comparison. Really good analogy too. Comparison. Colleen, um, I think, I, I think he also um, blames Pekka for Jordy's death, 100%. and uh, I think that's even more than um, having lost everything. If he hadn't lost Jordy, things might have been different. Yeah, agree. But he also wanted Pekka to, sorry, it's Knox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he wanted Pekka to feel the, the importance of it. I mean, it was just, for Pekka, killing Jordy was just a Tuesday. And, and he didn't remember why Kaz, you know, was Kaz. And Kaz wanted him to really 
feel it. Say my brother's name and I will let you go. All you, all you have to do is just say my brother's name. And he's like, I don't know who he is. I don't remember what happened. And that leads me to a point of the actions that you do to someone might mean nothing to you, but could change the other person forever. And this is a big thing that I think about, like with parenting, where it's like, you can say a throwaway comment as a parent, but your kid can just whoosh, latch onto that and it really affects them. Uh, you can say high school, you can say a throwaway line and it can affect that person just so hardcore and you'll never ever, like you won't even realize. And that's, I think a really powerful lesson. That's a hard one, you know, like how are you to know? How are you to know that an insignificant thing that you do, I mean, in this case, it's like, you have fucked two kids. No, well, 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 you fucked them over. Like you set them up to fail. You took advantage of them and you left them out to dry. You were like, oh, they'll pick themselves up and figure it out. And he's like, no, no, you didn't. You didn't think that that was a possibility. You made sure that we were like, we were like, <laughs> we should have died. One of us did. We died in our own way that day. And you were 100% responsible for that. Um, Avery made a great point as well. Inej was so terrified that Kaz actually did that, that he actually kidnapped the son and buried him alive. And I think that that's telling about how much she really trusts him. And Kate follows up saying, exactly. She knows that Kaz always schemes and lies and runs scams, but she still believed this one. And it shows that they really don't have a strong base for a relationship beyond even the touching thing. Hmm. The ax forgets, but the tree remembers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Geez, brothers named Geordie don't make it far in literature. It, Grisha verse. What, the name Geordie? Uh, I didn't read it. Um, you have that power as a teacher too. Yeah. You, anyone has that power over anyone. Oh, it's Georgie. Okay. Uh, and that's the really unnerving thing. Like I had a friend tell me, yeah, you said this one thing to me and it kind of like really affected me. And I was like, I don't even remember saying that. I'm so sorry. Like I didn't mean for it to be done in a negative way. And I remember like, you know, my mum, when I was nine years old, she's like, oh, Maud, piss off. And I was like, <clears throat> and like, it really, 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 really impacted me. And so something like that can be super throwaway, just sticks its landing. I'm going to try my mum again. I'm really interested to know if um, she would disown me in that way. She's online. I'm just trying to get her to pick up. Uh, what time is it there? It's like 11.30 in the morning. She is. Hello, Mama. Hello. Hi. I just can't just put this up. Hold on, really quickly. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, what, what I was talking, I'm just thinking about this theme in this book, and I'd like to refer back to my earlier question. If I broke the law yeah. and I stole hundreds of thousands of, like, let's just say you tried to send oh, me no, to. Listen, I'm going to have to. No, no, this I is important. This is important. Uh, this is important. I'm trying to get the volume up and it's on full. <laughs> All right, so this is the thing. You s hypo I'll just talk louder. I'll talk louder and slower. Hypothetically, right. you sent me off to uni and you paid the $100,000 bill to send me to uni. I didn't pay the $100,000. No, I know. Hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically yes. you send me off yes. to uni, $100,000, and after four yes. years you come to visit me at uni only to discover that I took the money, I gambled it away, I fell into a gang, we ran a club and we were doing really kind of like bad shit. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. And I actually was in so deep that my leader of the gang dragged you into a heist so that you could be decepting, like deceptive and play a part in yeah. that. But it was to help me. Would you do it? Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, it's uh, difficult but obvious. <laughs> okay. How's that? I love you, Mum. Okay, I love you too. Listen, no, no, gotta go. Gotta go. Talk to me in 10 minutes when I've unpacked all the 
Sounds great. Love it. Love it. Love you. Oh, she saved me! <laughs> you heard all that? <laughs> yeah, but I predicted she would have kept stuck by you. Damn, man. That's what it means to be a parent, huh? Kaz manipulated that, though. Kaz took advantage of that. All right. Anyway, wrapping things up. It's what we do. Oh, you're so cute, all of you. You're so cute. Ugh. Um, we find out Kawhi was not actually shot. That was all a ruse as well. Um, he drank a poison to slow his heart down. Nina and Matthias are trying to evacuate Kawhi. Kawhi is swapping out the body for a corpse so that he can, we can fake the death. Then Matthias encounters a young Fjordan soldier. And he believes that he can convince him to think outside the beliefs. And this 14-year-old new six-month soldier is trying to hear Matthias say, I thought that as well. We don't have to choose violence. I'm going to come with you. I'll come in peace. You don't have to do this. I know. Boom. And shoots him. Did anyone see this coming? Nope. No. Not at all. And then we move on to uh, trying to heal Kauai. Zoya summons lightning. Uh, Aaron spoke about this a little bit earlier, saying that she really she's a, a squalor, which means that she can only manipulate the wind. So the fact that she can call upon lightning from a storm just shows how her Grisha powers can evolve and how you can harness that. Uh, I just want you to know that I was listening and crying while cooking dinner. And this is my third read of it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually did see it coming during the conversation they were having. I knew it would end badly. Oh, I know, because he just kept going. He's like, no, trust me. And he's like, you're moving too much and saying too much. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, Nina is still being challenged about her future, uh, future with the Grisha army. This is something that doesn't actually really go away. She wants to spend her future with uh, Matthias. They are starting to plan their future together. And Zoya keeps saying, you're still in the army. You can't leave. You can't flee. You can't abandon it. You need to really figure out where your loyalties lie. And then Matthias is shot and he's still worrying about if he can even kiss. And in his last moments, he just wants to plant one on his lover. Well, not even. They didn't even get to. How did you feel about Matthias's death? All right, Kate, you're up. Was it necessary or was this trope always going to end in tragedy? What do you think? I think it was realistic. If you want to take a real world example... Druskel are very QAnon alt right indoctrinated in cell kind of society. Like this kind of very toxic narrow masculinity yep. sort of thing. When you look at those groups, they're very zealotry in their beliefs. So you can like Matthias fought his way out of it, but like there's that need like play stupid games win stupid prizes like do you think that matthias is like that it cre is the exception we're not all gonna be matthias yeah do you think matthias, matthias, had, is the matthias had the six of crows matthias had a kaz and inej all these people who gave him different views on life the other Druskel do not have that all they have is their zealotry so there was no way matthias was going to talk this kid down from the ledge this kid was like a suicide by cop martyr kind of you know these sort of guys we see on the news where they do like church shootings and school shootings and this is the lifestyle that the Druskel build so this again it wasn't romantic like and it was senseless loss of a life of a man who was turning his life around but that's what happens in these lifestyles so Matthias so is the exception was... and not the rule Yes, absolutely. And that's why I said, like, you never saw American History X, but that's what happens in that movie. Got it. It's the same thing as, like, you know, neo-Nazis, where, you know, you go into this lifestyle and you keep trying to turn your life around, but there's a lot of bridges there that it's don't all life. get burned, right? Yeah, it's a life commitment, yeah. So it 100% made sense, 100%. 
Hey, Avery, do you want to read that out? Because I didn't get that when I listened to it and I just nearly burst into tears on a live stream. Yeah, so um, the first line of Matthias' first chapter in Six of Crows is the same as the first line of Matthias's last chapter in Crooked Kingdom, and it is, Matthias was dreaming again, dreaming of her. But of course, in the first one, he's dreaming of like chasing her through the snow and like killing her. And in the last one, it's he's finally found her and he's finally home. And it's um, really sad. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I was like, oh, they're giving him a chapter just to kind of like confirm it. <laughs> I didn't piece that together. <laughs> oh, crap. That's really well done. That's really well done. Um, Colleen, you said Matthias didn't really have a place to go, but he did. He planned to educate and to unbrainwash the Driscella. He was talking to Nina about it. He's like, I've found my purpose. There's hope. I can be the one. There's hope. I can be the one. I, I don't think that would have been a practical... Um, I mean, I think that's a very worthy goal, but in, uh, unless he can deal with Druscula one-on-one, uh, -on -one, that, um, that society, that mindset is way too entrenched and they, they draw from each other to um, support that attitude. So uh, literally I the pack mentality, ah, wolves. Uh, yes, yes. I I don't think he would have ever found a safe place. And she was being torn in two directions as well, saying, you can't choose him. You need to come back to the academy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, I hear that. Um, my understanding for this was because this, this is like an ancient, this is like a Shakespearean tragedy, a Greek tragedy, um, the trope is that two opposing teams fall in love when they shouldn't and it's forbidden love and it ends it ends in tragedy. It has to. And so when this happened, I was like, uh, here we go. Yeah, it's like it's formulaic in this particular way. And I went through every other character and I was like, what does this look like if it was anyone else? Could we have – if you had to kill one? And I like this is a loaded question, but who wants to answer this one? If one of the six had to go, who should, could, would it have been if not Matthias? My vote is for Kaz. Yeah. Because these people can only be better off after being under the thumb of Kaz. <laughs> like, I know he loves them in a weird way, but still, they would all be better off without being under his control. But also his entire purpose was wrapped up in this one thing. He couldn't even see beyond that. It was so consuming. And then he hit his goal. He reached it. it that would kind of like, there was a finality in that, or there could have been a final, finality in that. Kate, what do you think? Just typed it in there. The path of revenge dig two graves uh, so as is almost already dead he's like a ghost he yeah. is the only thing propelling him if you want to think about like necromancy and nina's powers to control the dead the only magical spark propelling him was destroying pekka now that like pekka's running and diminished and destroyed he's a ghost he may be walking and breathing he didn't learn anything, didn't grow from that. He got his revenge, but he's just walking the same places. He's still haunting the same place he always haunted. He's a ghost. Yeah. So really, physically, he probably, like, if anyone quote-unquote deserved it, he's already dead. Yeah. Uh, Avery, that kind of leads into your point as well, if you want to address it. Yeah, um, basically, same like similar thing is that uh, everything that Kaz has done like has been towards that one goal. So if 
he had died, it would have been his own fault, more or less. Like, if somebody kills him, it's because Kaz probably did something to them first. So, like, that would have been the least tragic. So if, so since I'm assuming um, Lee Barduga was going for tragic in the scene, uh, killing off Kaz wouldn't really have been that effective because it would have been almost like a, I don't know, like a mercy ending for him because he's just like. Yeah. Actually, we would have been more upset for Inej. We would have said that that would have been too unfair on her. Yeah. Because we're rooting exactly. for her so hard. She's the light, you know. She's the good and She's the one who makes sure that Pekka actually leaves. This was what it was really interesting. Kaz plays a game where it's more provoking than ending. So he'll do something and then the Pekka's like, you're fucked. Like, I'm going to haunt you. This will never be over. I have to one-up you. And this one-upmanship means that when you're in the revenge game and you do something to make your point and then it's over, it's not for them. And they come back at you and then you've got to keep going. And it's this cycle that just doesn't stop. And so you're right. It would be mercy for Kaz to kind of be like, all right, we did it and now I'm done. Um, Nox, I saw that you unmuted earlier. Did you want to weigh in on the person who's not Matthias, who could have, would have? Done? Well, I was, I was also following along with Sprinkles on, on it being Kaz, but mm. I think on a broader space, it's, it, it's significant that one of the six doesn't make it to the end of the book. But Wyland said it, that they all had to make it. Avery even quoted it. We were all supposed to make it. Oh. Yeah, but I think that the pathos that Lee Bardugo brings into it, it's it's it, it's a, was a, a wake up call, sort of like wow, yeah. that came out of nowhere. Yeah, uh, I love Sprinkles quoting the Princess Bride. I've been in the revenge business so long, I don't know what to do with myself. That's it. When you only have your eye on that one prize, and you don't actually live a full and whole life. Um, it, the story wraps up with the complete unraveling of Van Eck. Kaz completely achieved what he set out to, and that wasn't just ruin him, but ruin his entire reputation. Um, it's the final nail in the coffin. We discover that Kaz has forged the will so that Wylan has complete control of the Van Eck estates and monies, which means it's up to Wylan whether he even helps pay the bail, which I don't even think Van Eck was even offered a bail because he has been charged with so much. He's responsible for Alice, who apparently lived with him for months, but it's like, did she have the kid? Do we even work? Anyway, they shipped her off to the lake house, which I thought was so funny. Um, where's a pirate captain when you need one? Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Stormhunt. Why don't... They, oh, my God. Why don't they tailor Kaz to be like Stormhunt and take over? Oh, Terry, that's really good. Yeah, she can go diddle the music teacher. And she lit up and blushed over that, didn't she? So she's set. She's happy. She's a little ditzy princess and life's going to be fine for her. Um, what's really interesting now, though, will be the relationship between Wylan and Jesper. So... Colm and, Jess, uh, Colm and Wyland had a little chat where it's like, hey, my son, even though he's a bit of a train wreck, he'd be really good for you. Jesper can't have any money. He's been given an allowance by Wyland. So obviously this partnership's going to be the fact that they trust each other so much. Jesper's never going to fuck over Wyland. Jesper can read. They can look after this date so they can be a partnership and a pair over this. Wyland's Jesper's sugar daddy. <laughs> yes. But like... I don't know. Is that dynamic realistic? Because money like that and the change of the dynamic usually is going to be really hard. But I guess Wyland's weakness, it, it evens out that power dynamic. I've got all this money. I can't read. You can. I'll give you money. You help me. It's a, I guess it's a good partnership. But it's locked in for life. Like there ain't no wiggle room with that one. How did you feel about the end of this book? How it kind of all tied it up quite neatly and Pekka has been threatened by Inej with the cut across the uh, over the heart saying don't come back cuz I'll just keep I'll keep cutting you until I cut your heart out. Where did she learn that ruthlessness from? That's a Kaz move and a half. Ooh ooh, she learned from the best. Um but having Wylan take over all the estates, uh comms all good. Everything's all 
peachy peachy what do you think about the end of the book specifically who wants to weigh in was it too good are we feeling bad for nina um i would say that i was feeling a, a, a remorse for nina because you know like she she could see a future with matthias even though matthias couldn't necessarily give it to her you know and so it's very heartbreaking but the overall story was very like a uh, bow wrapped in a bow kind of thing like yeah. maybe like if possible like uh, a to be continued on a tv show kind of thing like maybe it happens you know like, i was waiting for like yeah in two years time and it's like oh yeah, exactly and then she opened up an actual sweet shop oh with lollies <laughs> or like nina sorry opened up an actual sweet shop and then all this other stuff and you're like oh that's just everything's great yep yep it's funny you say that about two years' time because I think that's about the time frame for uh, <laughs> King of Scars. Of course it is. Good. Good. <laughs> um, did anyone have any gripes about the ending? We felt good about it? Final thoughts? I like the way things were tied up. Yeah. All right. Avery? Uh, yeah. Um, it's in the chat, but um, I think that they're, they were all about as happy as they can be. I don't know if any of them will ever be like, happy like i don't think a happy ending is possible for any of them but they're all at a point where they're satisfied i guess where i mean got except for Mina, mm -hmm. but um yeah so like they all had to sacrifice something to get what they have at this point and i think that's important and i think like they're still room for them to have a story later if uh, Ali Bardugo decides to do that, which she has hinted at. Um, but they're at a point now where these this particular story is wrapped up in a way that I think is satisfying for the characters. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm really looking forward to the next ones. And that's your homework. We uh, Let's have a look at sort of like the schedule that we have with this. This was the last book for um the duology that we're doing the 16th and the 23rd we're having off the 21st mark it in your calendars i will be on patrick rothfuss's cha um, channel if you want a quick read for the next uh 10 or so days i am never gonna get the name of this book right the site si si <laughs> the slow regard of silent things patrick rothfuss and i are going to be talking about um a character breakdown of the protagonist of the small i've already forgotten it <laughs> i don't know why this book title does not sink in the slow regard of silent things by patrick rothfuss we are going to be talking about that book on you just read that yay i haven't read wise man fear yet i don't think i should watch this no 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 it's completely separate it's all about ori so Ori, who lives in the school, is completely separate. It doesn't spoil anything from either of those books. It's a standalone story from Ori's perspective. And apparently he had someone make a comment about how she's written that he never even thought of, but realized that they're exactly right. So I'm reading, reading the book right now. He actually narrates the audio book. So read that one if you can. Um, and then on the 21st on his channel, I'm going to be chatting with him about the slow regard of silent things. Um, that'll be a lot of fun. Is that how we're going to direct the raid? Can do, Thierry. Did you drop the points? You did. Oh, not Sage. It's STS Beecher and dropped the... Cool. We can do that. Um, and then on the 30th. Uh, so the 16th we have off completely. The 21st I'll be on Patrick Rothfuss's channel to do the slow regard of silent things. And the 30th we're doing Cemetery Boys, which I haven't even started. We're doing that for Nerdist at the end of the month as well, which means the 7th and the 14th of July, we'll be covering the first book of the next duology, du duology series. I'm going to pull up my 
books, library, king of scars, and then we'll be doing rule of uh, wolves for August. And then we're probably going to do all Dresden or all the other books and all that fun shit because this is a good book club. Um, king of scars and then rule of wolves. So that'll be July's book as well. So that's what the future has in store for us. I'm going to find Not Sage's Twitch because STS spent 3,000 channel points to guide the raid, which I will do. Channel. Thank you, everyone. If you do decide to stick along and help guide that raid and drop by Not Sage's channel, tell her Maud sent you. Uh, she's playing Resident Evil Village at the moment. Um, tell her we had a little book club and that even though there's only 37 of us, we pack a punch and we raid with prowess. Uh, and drop by and say hi. Uh, appreciate you all. We finished another book together. That's fun. Uh, that's the second one we've done. We've done Six of Crows and now this one, Crooked Kingdom. Uh, say hi to Not Sage. You've all been great. I'm going to go to bed, <laughs> literally. I have a very early start tomorrow. Thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for my weirdest, my weird mood that I had earlier. But we did it. I'm proud of everyone. And I'm super excited to read the next book. It's going to be good. Bye. Bye. I think it's gone on to Sages now. Thanks, guys. You're all awesome. That was great. Peace out. Have a good rest. Will do. Thanks, everyone. Excited for the next book. You're all wonderful. Oh. I know. Can't wait. Thanks, Lise. Bye, everyone.